Welcome to the worst movie podcast in the world, where this week we're breaking all the rules. That's right. We're going to talk about Fight Club. Isn't that right, Joe? <laughs> it is. And we're also breaking our rule. Our own rules? Our own rules. This is, a, this is another old movie in a row. That's our own rules broken. Ooh. But it fits, you know, it fits the, the theme of this episode, you know? Which is what? Breaking rules, man. Don't break the first rule. Well, we're going to talk about Fight Club. Yep. We're going to do it without Cameron or Dekos. We don't need them for this. <laughs> and, you know, uh, maybe we're hemorrhaging members, like season six of Community, but it's fine. The podcast is going strong as ever. Yeah, exactly. We've lost a, We've lost a member per episode at this rate next week. It'll just be a one-man show. We're running a fight to the That's death. That's right. Uh, I'd like to announce that I'm leaving the podcast starting next week. It'll be the Joe show. <laughs> no, no, we should just fight it out like um, Tyler Durden and the other one. <laughs> <laughs> it just becomes you talking to your alter ego for like 60 minutes. <laughs> I mean, that's like, that that would be a podcast I'd listen to. To somebody talking to themselves <laughs> from different perspectives. I mean, that, that's a pretty good idea, right there. Anyway, I mean, it's a mean idea. That's where the podcast is going at this rate. <laughs> but anyway, we're talking about 1999's Fight Club, the film that uh, Letterbox describes with the simple line: "Mischief, mayhem, soap." <laughs> And it is directed by David Fincher. He's a very well well known director from America. The movies like Seven, Zodiac, The Social Network, and of course, Alien Cubed. Everyone Alien. Alien Cubed. Hey, I don't know Especially if I've ever Cameron, heard. Cameron, and he's not here this week to defend himself. I don't know so, if I've ever heard of Alien Cubed. It's Alien Free, but the the art for it. It's clearly Alien Cubed. Ah, I and it's see. Cameron's favorite Alien film. Did you? Oh uh, yes, I know, I know. I will vouch for that. Uh, Cameron yeah. loves it. Never stops talking about it. He never stops talking about Alien Cubed. Right. I think uh, we should start with just a, a brief overview of the film. Get some initial thoughts. Okay. I personally really like this film. Uh, I've watched it a few times. It, it's definitely my favorite. Um, Brad Pitt film. Now I can't, I can't, I can tell you all. Favorite Brad Pitt. Yes, and I know what you're gonna say. I know what you're gonna say because I, I, I asked you the question, right? What's your favorite Brad Pitt film? I know what the answer Match. is. Yes, but Actually, I, I, I don't know though, man. The, the, I feel like Snatch in this film feel like very similar. I don't, very, they're very similar. I don't know why. The way they're edited is very yeah, yeah. similar. I think it's like the way it's shot, but. I don't know. I get the feeling it's just, it's I get like, that they're very it's like similar. The quick this mm-hmm. is something I like. You know, we're skipping ahead a bit, but screw it. I'm going to talk about it anyway. Uh, when he's there, we're at like the end with the van. And, oh yeah, you know, he finds the bomb and then he yeah. fights himself. That bit has an insane number of cuts, almost like hot fuzz. I know. Yeah, it's fucking all over the place. But, but it, it is, kind it of is. adds to it. It's yeah. good. It kind of adds to that. He's fighting himself. Mm. Kind of a bit of a mindfuck moment. Pretty good. And I will say as well, it is a way better performance from uh, Edward Norton than he did in a Glass Onion, which uh, we haven't got to uh, yet. Yeah. Th- okay. This is something maybe we should address last. So at the end of last week's episode, or because we're a timeless podcast, uh, the end of the Crank episode, yeah. we said we'd be doing Glass Onion next week. That's been pushed back again. After our first episode, we were meant to then do Glass Onion. <laughs> yeah. Crank instead because Decos <laughs> couldn't make it. And now neither Decos or Cameron can make it. So we're doing Fight Club. So we, we went for a better Edward Norton film. A better Edward Norton. And he is very good in this film. He is very, very good in this film. Very good. Not as good as he is in um, The Incredible Hulk. But uh, that's a, oh, a conversation God, for another the, day. The Incredible Hulk. That film. Top tier. Top tier. Edward, Nor- Edward Norton just has banger after banger. You know, Fight Club, and then he improved on it with Incredible Hulk. I mean, that's probably peak of his career, I'd say. I don't know. Nah, you know what? 
peak, you want to know what peak of his career was? What? He's apparently in Sausage Party. As who? As Sammy Bagel Jr. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> what? Oh, back bro, to I, the haven't thought, I haven't thought about that, that film for ages. Jesus, I remember that was a whole thing. Did they uh, ever make a film, second one? This film has the wildest reviews. Uh, so, ju- this is Sausage Party, by the way, looking at it on Letterboxd. Because it is just all over the place. <laughs> People either seem to like this film, really like this film. Actually, it is a bizarre, they just, bizarre just movie. just everything this film. It is a bizarre film. Did they ever make a second one? No, I don't think they did. I don't think they'd be allowed. But yeah, maybe the it was. It was directed. Was it directed by um Seth Rogen? No, Conrad Vernon and Greg Tiernan. I thought Seth Rogen had like. No, but Seth Rogen is. He's in it though, the isn't he? Character, and I'm guessing, yeah, he was a producer I would have, on it and yeah. a writer. Oh yeah, so it, it was basically made by him. That makes sense. This is a very Seth Rogen movie. It is. Um, yeah, I, I think maybe maybe this is like what Brad. Brad Pitt's better films because he's. Just I been definitely in, like, agree. I, I, he's been I, it's got to be one of films. his most, most famous. Like you know when like you you hear like you see when you think of Brad Pitt and like you think of Brad yeah. Pitt characters. I think Tyler Durden is one that pops out to most people. It's a it's a very like iconic character. I think just the everything about him. Well, it feels almost like it's more like the films that sort of hit him. It's like one of those films that sort of uh, started his one of those like big films that started his career as a movie star, as opposed yeah, to just. Yeah, I an agree. Actor. I agree. Because then, you know, then, uh, at, yeah, Fight Club, at Fight Club, Snatch, and Ocean's Eleven all released within this like few, you know. Three yeah, I was going to say. I was going to say. Look up when was, Snatch came out because I I feel like well, he was this probably film was about the same. Snatch when was two thousand. Ocean's Eleven was two thousand one. So in this yeah, three year so. period. Some, from from like, this free snack, that's definitely going to cap. Yeah, it's going to catapult him, isn't it? Did you actually know in Snatch? Uh, can you guess the actor that the role of uh, Mickey the Gypsy was actually created for? Hmm. Is it uh, an American actor? No. No. It's an Irish actor. An Irish actor. Irish Is it... actor. Oh, okay. He's very well known. Yes. Um, Irish actors. And act what? Ugh, give me a, a hint. What other movies has he been in? Banshees of Inner Sharon. I don't know what that is. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, I don't know. I, I can't. I can't think of any Irish actors. Oh, fuck! I forgot his name. I've <laughs> 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 oh, got it. All right. Colin Farrell. Oh, Colin Farrell. Oh, fuck. Yeah. Colin, Colin I, f- Farrell. I forget that he's Irish because he only plays fucking American roles. Yeah, but in no, in Banshees of Inner Sharon and in Bruges, he's Actually, unapologetically it, Irish. He's quite Irish. Is he Irish in um, Gentleman? He is, isn't he? He has that very thick... I have thick, not seen The Gentleman. I'm pretty sure he has like a very thick Irish accent in that as well, so it makes sense. But I forget that he is Irish. I've only what have I seen him in? There was that it was that police show, I think. He was American, and yeah, fucking can't remember. It went very good. <laughs> um, but yeah, um, overall, this uh, uh, this this movie just it is it's just it doesn't make sense, but it does, and it's so bizarre in that way. Well, this Joe is one of the movies from that Millennium Mindfuck era of films, where films sort of, you know, they, they said screw it to conventional narrative schemes and decide to mix it up. I'm talking, you know, stuff like Mulholland Drive. Yeah. Your me- you know, Memento. These films that sort of changed how you could make a film. And Fight Club, whilst it does tell a linear story, it doesn't fit. It still fits into that. So I don't know. I, I wouldn't say it does tell a linear story because, like, the whole, the whole. Uh, it, I don't I mean, know, well, man. It's so it fucking where strange. It begins, which nowadays is True. kind of one of those like tropes that kind of. But sucks. the way it gets, and I think it, that hurt, yeah, but it's that like the film. I think. <sighs> I don't know, but it's like it's like it goes from a a, a movie about a guy 
is we struggle sleeping. All right. And then it becomes like an action, you know, like a standard fighting film, like underground fighting could like, you know, we, it gives lots of films like that. Like, I don't know if you watch the film fighter with like Channing Tatum in it and shit like that. Like they're all, they, they all feel quite similar, but then it, then it goes into a, like a, um, V for Vendetta type conspiracy film. And then leads up to the final act when, I mean, all shit's hit the fan. And you don't really know how you've got there. But then yeah. he still talks his way into making you understand it. Yeah, I, it, it, it bends genres. It yes, just, there we go. It that's, just that's keeps what I'm flipping to what it is. Mm. And it, that's what makes it so confusing. Kind, kind of like everything everywhere all at once. Yeah. Kind of like that. Yeah, but I, I, I don't know. It's like... Everywhere, everything, all at once. There was still like one main. Like, <sighs> There's still a main thread that you're sort of pulling yeah, as you yeah. go along the plot. Whereas in Fight Club, you never really, even though it, you know where it ends up, you never really know how you're going to end up there. Exactly, exactly. And I, I think you summed it up really well. It is. It, there's so many. I think this film is like uh, an accumulation of like different different movies in one. Like you. I could sit and watch a film about Edward Norton, like fighting his m- crazy, oh. like mental okay. illness in the first half, and then I would also enjoy watching a film that's just Brad Pitt and Edward Norton in an underground fight club. And then there's another part of the film at the end where it's like conspiracy terrorist organization, how they got there. It's just, it's just a weird, it's crazy. It's so much shit in this movie. <laughs> you see, I think I know what you're trying to get at there, and I'm actually going to say it's a, fl- a bit of a flip from where you are. Uh, I feel like this movie actually inspired a lot of those future films, stuff like V for Vendetta, because this film came before those. Yeah, this true. film. I like, can see. When you, look, yeah. when you look, when you look at you know the Millennium Mindfuck films as a whole, Fight Club is a very pivotal film mm. in the, almost the expansion of that genre. I don't. I think if this film had failed, we wouldn't see just so many that came after it, other directors deciding to be as ambitious as this film was at the time. If that makes sense. Yeah, no, I can see that. This is how, like, it's, um, it, it takes, especially when you get to, like, the second half of the movie and, you know, you're fully involved in this whole, like, conspiracy underground, but essentially terrorist group that are you know f- fighting to take down whomever it's quite light-hearted and m- makes yeah. a, a lot of jokes even though like the source like even though the, the concept is quite fucked up um it's quite light-hearted in how it does it and i think mo- i think you're right movies like um v for vendetta have so probably took a lot of inspiration from like that segment of the film it's very similar in that sense yeah, I, I will expand on the lightheartedness, and I just want to focus for a second on a particular scene, which is the one where Helen Bonham Carter's character tries to kill herself. Oh my god. Okay. Now, th- I mean, d- like, actually just thinking about it, it's a pretty dark scene, but then it's almost made quite funny by the fact that when they're leaving, you know, with Brad Pitt, she leaves the apartment, and she's just there shit talking herself. <laughs> yeah, and she's like, she's like, oh, she's fucking boring. She's fucking a bitch. Like, she's just <laughs> just to these cops, and Brad Pitt is just desperately trying to get her out of there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, again, that's, that's what I mean. Like, this is so many ass, and like even that first part. I mean, the, the movie starts with essentially like a 15 minute monologue of like them picking apart all these focus groups that have some of like the worst, um, like people who are going through some of like the worst ordeals, like illnesses and like death, depression. And he's just there like cracking jokes about it in like in his, in his own mind. Yeah. And then, as well, I think it's almost quite funny that it's like when Helen Bonham Carter's character shows up, but Edward Norton's then like, she's ruining it. Yeah. Ruining it for me. Yeah. I don't feel this. <laughs> <laughs> and Bob. 
Bob, best Bob. character in the film. Man. Bob's a smash. Bob's a smash for sure. Yeah. Give him a wig. Call him Bobette. <laughs> he's got he's got the big enough tits for it, mate. The, the way he, the way they described that scene as well, when uh, he was like describing what happened to him, how they boost up his um, hormones or something, and essentially yeah. turn his bodybuilder into this like lump. It's, I mean, again, like it's just that's just unnecessary context. Why is it there? I don't know. But it makes sense. Well, that character as well is played by Meatloaf. Is it? It's played by Meatloaf, the guy who sang Bad Out of Hell. No, it, no way. A hundred percent. Because I caught this during uh, the credits, which is that Meatloaf is in this. I was just like, who the fuck? Who does he play? Surely it's not Bob. It's Bob. <laughs> that, make, that, it's makes Bob. Bo- that makes Bob's character even better now. Makes him even better. They should have. They, they should have had a number of films. Meatloaf is in, by the way. Just I like, didn't even know he box. was in any. He's in Sausage Party, apparently, as well. Oh, wow! So well, I thought he was. You know. I thought he died a long time ago. <laughs> I thought he was like long gone. And so, I no, it was only January twenty twenty two. Almost Wait, what? exactly a year ago. Oh, maybe twentieth of January, twenty twenty-two. I don't know what. Maybe I just forgot about that. But no, twenty twenty-two is a fucking I, long year. I thought he died oh like God. years ago. Yeah, it, you would think so, but no. Died last year, and he was in Sausage Party <laughs> and right. Spice World. And what? And Spice World. I don't know what I'd say. <laughs> Oh, I'm putting this on my watch list on Letterbox. Where at some point we're watching Spice World. It's about <laughs> zany adventures that follows the Spice Girls and their entourage, mostly fictional characters. Manager Clifford, his assistant Deborah, and filmmaker Piers, who is trying to shoot a documentary on the real Spice Girls. <laughs> <laughs> this, <laughs> this. <laughs> Yeah, we're watching this on the podcast at some point because <laughs> the top review is this is my Citizen Kane. <laughs> All right. Anyway, let's I, do the, this I, is I, the yes, longest I, intro segment. Some yes. of that might even belong in. <laughs> we shall we shall rebrush up on it. I think it's time for the uh, the, log the log line showdown. So we're now going on to log line showdown. Oh, the show. This is this is the segment where we each come up with a log line and face off in a winner takes all scenario to see yeah. who has the best <laughs> one at the end of the season, which will be end of the year. Whoever has won the most log line showdowns will win a sweet prize. Oh yeah, what prize is that? What you is the prize, Ryan? I, oh. I imagine we'll go to a charity shop and get some like karate trophy, and <laughs> then you know whoever wins each year gets to keep the karate trophy as a show of honor. I, I mean, there's nothing idea. more that I want than that. Yeah, exactly. I mean, what could you want more? It it literally shows that you're a fucking giga chad who's won log on <laughs> show. I would like to say I'm currently in the lead. I'm pretty sure. I'm, are, I'm pretty sure I've won all won. of them so far. Yeah, but I'm just one point, one point ahead from everyone else. You know. You are, yeah, you are winning on literally one one. All right. Okay. Okay. Uh, well, I, I, I think I don't know who. I, I think because it's just the two of us, and I'm still thinking. <laughs> I think I think you should go first. I want to hear your your log line. Okay. Go on. Some- to sum up the f- film, as an emotional aspect in the hook you win. After suffering from a bout of insomnia, Edward Norton Antivirus <laughs> in- is unable to prevent Brad Pitty and Malware from infecting a hold of his brain <laughs> and leading him headfirst into the world of terrorist group Incel. Wow! But that was stepping it up a notch this week. The hell was that? <laughs> what the hell was that? Tell me that's not what the film's about, huh? I mean, that is that is what the film's about. I even I even linked it to the Incredible Hulk because Edward Norton. God did damn it! Norton antivirus in that film. Oh, God damn it! I ain't gonna compete with that. Whatever I come up with, even though I haven't come up with one yet. Come on, you. <laughs> okay, right. 
how to sum up this film. Okay, this this film. <laughs> Edward Norton, the movie. I mean, I mean, <laughs> what more do you need? It is. Ed, the, I mean, there's a bit of insight the to the film. Was more about his life. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> it's Edward Norton in the film. You know, from start to finish, you may not have known at the start of the film that it's Edward Norton in the movie, but by oh, the shit, end, you are no, one of because he is the Hulk. <laughs> That's a split personality as well. <laughs> do you see? Every film that Edward Norton is in, no matter the character, he's playing himself. Fuck, even in Birdman, he was, like, happy for a bit. And then there we go. No he was yeah. bang him at home for a period. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think, I think that's how you just sort of can describe every movie that he's in. I mean I, I mean, I would say the parallels between this film and The Incredible Hulk are almost identical. It's about a guy who, uh, you know, his life's all over the place. He can't figure out a way to control oh, himself. I'm, so he takes sorry, on an God. alter ego. That's what I'm both sorry, films God. are. But there's no Liv Tyler in Fight Club. True. That is there's true. No Liv Tyler in Fight Club. And for that reason, I think I win Logline. But there is a Dud and Tyler. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> what the All right, you get the point. You get the point this week. Liv Tyler. Yeah. You you said... Tyler dad, no, I know. But you said Liv Tyler. And there is a wow in the formal in, on a formal letter it would be Dud and Tyler. Am I wrong? You're you're not. But there we go. You, uh, it's, all right. be, it's all right. Maybe Tyler live. So. You can uh, you can get the uh, you get the point this week. All right. <laughs> I'm just I, I'm just building up for uh, my comeback with a uh, glass onion. You know, I've been preparing glass for that onion. one. It's one I was prepared for this week. Yeah. I actually I hadn't created any of the stuff for it, so <laughs> I was gonna do it today. <laughs> All right, well that's uh is anyone keep are you keeping track of these points? Yeah, I've got what it's one for you, one for me, so Oh we, we did we didn't mark it down for the first week and I don't count the first week. I'm pretty sure I won that as well. I can't remember what they were. You but, don't get uh, the point though. There was you see, there was no karate trophy. True. You know, but now point. N- now I see the levels that we're stepping to because yours was quite a um, thought out, well processed logline. So I, I now it understand was not, that it there's was dumb as shit. <laughs> no, no. Now I understand the levels that we need to be going to. All right, Ryan takes this week. Congratulations. Thank you, thank you. I'd like to thank uh, just everyone who's got me to this point. Uh, no, Cameron, Decos, and that's it. That's all the people <laughs> I'd like to thank. Ah, <laughs> oh, great! I'm coming for that goddamn trophy, man. I want it to be. I we we need to get one of those like proper, you know, plastic shit ones. You know, I mean, the, even, the ones like, you get like at the scenario, power shop. Worst case scenario, get one of those that are like number one, dad. And we just, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and it will have to be called the, the worst movie trophy in the world, and it won't be wrong. Yeah, because it's not even about movies. <laughs> there we go. Right, moving on. We already pretty much delved into this in the introduction, but uh, I, I think I think we should just pick apart some of the more. Hang on, let me get up Cameron's notes. Oh. I think we need to pick apart some of the more, you know, general scenes. Some more general stuff. In the I, 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 I mean, I do want to start. Um. The beginning of this film, I don't know if anyone has picked up on it. I know earlier on we were talking about how uh, you know this film probably was inspiration to a lot of other like films that came after it. I mean, because it is kind of its own set thing. It's hard to fit it in a genre, as I said earlier. I, know, I, I think it fits in like that millennium mindfuck genre very well because it just it's just something's wrong about it. You know when after. I know this is like both of, for both of us at least. This isn't our first time watching it, mm. but on that first watch through, something just does not sit right. After you're done with this film, you just you know this, yeah, and you know oh, that at some the amount point, of stuff. Watch it. Oh yeah, I, I, I'm going to get onto that. But uh, the, uh, my first, the first thing I wanted to say was um, flipping what we were just saying. I think the beginning of this movie, 
it has to have been in inspired by another very famous mindfuck film that we also watched recently um american psycho now i don't know if you picked that up american but... psycho came after this did it it did american oh psycho was 2000 this was 99 Both, okay that I mean, changes I think things that Holly, i, I think that hollywood it... often does actually is double films so when you're like trying to make a script you will send it out to like every studio you can you know you're trying to get it to ah uh, yeah you're just trying to get it made so a really good example of this is uh, Olympus Has Fallen and White House Down. Yeah. Where it's the same year these two films about the White House being attacked by, like, terrorists came out. And the reason it exists is that this film got sent out to loads of other studios and then, you know, everyone goes, no, 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 we don't want that. We don't want that. But when that one studio goes, yes, this is a good idea, someone else is like, they're onto something and mm. because we miss this opportunity we'll just create our own one that's separate of them oh so well that very well might that. have been well, what happened well because like because the, the uh, film. yeah well i mean the scene in particular i'm talking about is uh, at the start of this film you know when he's yeah ha he's having when edward, norton, when edward norton's character is just having that initial you know, speaking to himself like breaking down his life and like contemplating everything and there's that scene in his flat when he's like expressing how he pick like going through catalogs and slowly picking picking bits out that fit perfectly that have no reason he doesn't really understand why he's uh, doing I, it at that i could listen to edward norton read just the argos catalog to us for literal days it's amazing yeah, but and and, and it, but it, it, it gave me the same like listening to that and watching that gave me the same feeling as that it, big the opening monologue to American Psycho when he's going through yeah. his day to day, and I just got that I I immediately felt like okay this is either inspired or has inspired or you know they they've got the same feel about them. Yeah, because they're, they're quite the, similar the characters, well. really, aren't they? No, I wouldn't say in the characters so much, but I'd say the themes that the movie deals with. Because both are sort of a uh, that, yeah, but I think that's know, one and the same. They're both like sort of a mockery of uh, like that capitalist society. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. No, no, yeah, exactly. American Psycho is taking the piss out of the yuppie boys at the top, and then this film itself is very they're much like contrast. You know, consumer, the same. consumerism being yeah, shit. yeah. They're, they're like con. They're like different sides to the same story. If you know what I'm trying to say, like they like they contrast, but they they kind of feel like they're coming from the same place like they're both deranged yeah. they both have thoughts of all these of the of being a person that they're not you know in american psycho he has this whole creates this whole life for himself where he's a murderer when in reality he isn't that person same way as he does in fight club you know tyler durden as said in the film is the exact representation of himself that he wishes he was which leads him to do these things, but then you know he kind of backtracks on himself, like when it comes to the end, like the final, final scenes of the film, and like he tries to fix it because he realizes what's going on. But I don't know; they they, they feel like very similar. I get very similar feels from both of them. And also, and also, uh, and uh, just a scene I need to dis d discuss: how the how did he survive the bullet shot, the bullet at the end? Yeah, makes no sense. I mean, that I I know the film doesn't make any sense, but I think that even for this film, it's a bit of a stretch. He I shot think... himself in the face. Oh, okay. I think what so you could sort of see on his uh left cheek where the bullet had come out. I know, so I but think, it's a bit like I think instead of I think so instead of shooting himself like up through the brain, he shot himself through the cheek. I know, but it's so just... that way. It's it. It hasn't like killed him, but it's given this shock to him his system that has killed. Yeah, I, I know it's it's kind of that like it's kind of a metaphor for like killing that side of him. But still, he shot himself in the yeah, face, yeah. and he lived. yeah, but I think shooting he yourself even... in the face isn't necessarily a death sentence. There's like loads of accounts of people who shot himself. <laughs> yeah, I know, but it's a bit. I've, I've <laughs> it's just, but I mean, he just kind of gets up and carries on. He's still ble dude. He's bleeding out, and he's like holding. Shit. <laughs> yeah, but I think he just shot. I think he just shot. Off. I think he just shot through his cheek. I think that's what he did. Not shot. It's up a very his precise head. and accurate. Ty gun. Tyler Durden shows like the back of his head fucking open. 
Like, yeah, true. Movie. Yeah. Whereas we actually see behind Edward Norton, you can see it uh, on here <laughs> on the uh, general discussion that he isn't actually shot in the back of the head. It's just gone through his cheek. So it's just yeah. like a shock to the system that maybe is giving him like adrenaline or something that's just kicked that out of him. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of, it is, I know it's a metaphor for killing killing that side of his like personality, but I just thought it, it is a weird scene to watch. <laughs> but this movie as a whole there's so many i know i think we touched on it earlier there's so many you know you need to watch this film multiple times to pick things up there's so many details and bits that you don't even realize and you see that's part of the millennium mindfuck cycle of films this is when uh, we were actually seeing the transition away from vhs media towards dvds DVDs being much yeah. more easy to rewatch. You rewatch. To rewind after you're yes. Done. Yeah. You know, you can watch this over and over, and you know, you think as well. These films are available at say like Blockbuster. People are going renting them. They rent them again. The rewatchability. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Because is this your first time watching this film? Uh, this is my second. I watched it. I can't. Remember. It must have been like a year or mm. so back. But do you know about the um, the famous? snippets throughout the film where you see uh where it Brad gives Pitt. where you give it gives hints that um Brad Pitt's character is made up before you, like the reveal see, that he is in his yeah. head. This because this is what makes it rewatchable is that you see these moments where so at the start when he's in the uh, therapy tank you actually see like Yeah, he pops up doesn't he for like a, a frame of a figure. It isn't I actually paused it on the scene just to see who it was. Yeah. Whether it was Brad Pitt or it's not. Just one it's just one frame. Defined. It's just some guy who looks like he's kind of in a leather jacket. Like a red yeah. leather jacket. Exactly like the one Brad Pitt wears. Yeah. And this happens again as well before he appears. For it's, like it's foreshadowing, isn't it? It's the foreshadow, like what's going on. Can, can you imagine, though, going into like the cinema when this film first released and like sitting and watching it for that first time and you see these glimpses in that the way it's cut, the way it's edited, like the, the secret pop-ups and you wouldn't be able to go back and you might not be yeah. able to see it. Like it probably is one of the reasons why this film like became so iconic, like that quick, like people would talk about it and it's not, they don't really do stuff like that in films anymore. Like if they want to hide anything, they always just do an end credit scene or some crap like that. But like this film just had it hit it in plain sight, but it's like when you're watching it for that first time, if you're not able to just pause it, if you're in a theatre and you've got and, and you're seeing these pop ups and you're like, What the fuck was that? It just adds to the mind fuck. You it's it's like you are that character. Like you don't even know what you're seeing anymore. Yeah, you, you don't you even know if you've seen it or not. Nothing. And they literally reference it. it in the film. <gasps> They, 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 he, it's so well done. I, oh, I, no. bro, it's so well done that the director comments on his own directing choices in the script of the movie when they're telling you about Tyler Durden's first job doing the video reels in a cinema and like splicing in pieces of like tits and ass. It's in the film, so it popped up for a millisecond. And Joe, you're like, it was, Joe, it wasn't tits and ass. Oh no, it was, it was a big, big fucking dick. Okay, <laughs> there was. <And> <laughs> now, I'm gonna be honest. Did you pause it at the end? <laughs> no. <laughs> There's a dick spot in that joke. <laughs> of course, of course, there is. I would expect nothing else. I, it's oh just, my god! It is. Um, I mean, it, this took yeah, a bit that, on that scene at the cinema where it's just children and they're oh just crying, god, yeah. and the parents are looking at each other, and it's just so fucking weird, bro. I don't even know if, if you'd like. Imagine if there was a film nowadays where they openly say, "Oh yeah, one of the scenes we're, sh we're showing pornographic images to children." That <laughs> just that that just doesn't sound good. <laughs> But somehow in this film, oh, you're like, how do you oh. think they directed the children in that scene? <laughs> you think they just tell them to cry? Or this is so many bits in this film, man. But it is it is in the way it's like shot and edited as well. Like there's, it's oh, it leaves yeah. it open. Uh, well, I think what adds to like its mindfuck aspect is its quick cutting style. Yeah, 
because you don't have time to take in what you've just seen before you're moving on to something else. Yeah, you're just constant. You know, yeah. you're just constantly that, thrown into the next bit. Yeah, and the movie and deliberately it, it, does it things very to throw you off. So is similar to Requiem for a Dream, or a great film. Great film. Oh, you've actually seen that? I Requiem have seen it. Dream. It's a great film. I, I, I watched it last night. It's another film that feels very similar to this. The way in the way it's shot, like that grungy, dark. The mind like, fuck, Joe. Camera, I'm just, yeah, but just like the 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 tone of it as well, and and uh, yeah, this movie stars Jared Leto. Let's I talk about. about, I, was about I was literally about to bring that up because as well. This is one of his he's, first um, he, acting credits as well. This and um, Requiem for we got Requiem for Regime. I'm pretty sure after this because he's in it like so obviously... please say it's real name it's requiem for a dream oh wow that's rolls off the tongue doesn't it it does it really yeah because um, this, this, you can tell it's one of his first acting credits as well because he's only in it for like the second half of the movie like a little bit the blonde guy he's actually, just... he actually has been in quite a before this i'm just looking online uh, he's been in quite a few things before this but this is like his bigger Arguably one of his earlier big roles, and that he's well known for. He was good in this one. It's these kind of films this, that he sits this well. Along in. with American <coughs> Psycho and Requiem for a Dream. Oh yeah, he's in American Psycho, bro. It, he just he just fits in these types of films. But like I, I, they try I use him in other. I still stuff, think but. he's like easily one of the worst bits of this film, and it kind of. At the time, it wasn't valid much, but now just seeing him getting fucking beat up, yeah, <laughs> it's, it's so great. See, I um, like I, I like Jared Leto, so I think he's I quite re- good in this film. I really don't. I just he just doesn't do it for me. Same with like in Requiem for a Dream. Uh, he was arguably the weakest part of that. Same with American. Psycho no and... way, no way. Jared Leto's story and. Requiem for a Dream his is story, one, but his one of the best. performance isn't that great. Who, who, what, who doesn't do it for you in Requiem for a Dream? I don't know. They're all quite good, to be fair. But I thought they were. All I think level. Jared Lowe's of of our four, you know the four main characters. Jared Lowe is the weakest. I think. Mm. I mean, he's definitely the weakest in Suicide Squad, but he won't. That's a whole and I think disaster. he's one of the weakest here. Like I think meat. He only has he only has a small meatloaf part. Meatloaf good dinner, but you don't a... know it's meatloaf. <clears throat> well, I didn't anyway. At least you like Jared Leto is recognised, but well, you know it's a Jared Leto part. I just feel disappointed anytime I see him in the film. Like he has, he, he's, he's I mean, had a bad track record. Blade Runner twenty forty nine. You can't tell me that Jared Leto is great in. Like... He, he's had. He's just had like a. He's had a bad run, run at the moment. He's tried to start a cult. He's in a shit band. He's got nothing. Whoa, 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 whoa! I would not have blasphemy <laughs> again. Thirty seconds to Mars is poopy, poopy. How dare you? <clears throat> they have one good song, all right. I'll leave it at that. <laughs> <clears throat> the one based off a movie <laughs> that he's not in. <laughs> And essentially, his music video is a worse rendition. So maybe you've got a point. <laughs> yeah, I've got a point. <laughs> <laughs> um, and yeah, so I, I think the last point, the last thing to bring up is obviously the uh, the climax of the film. Of course. That I mean, we've got the end shot right here. Right when here, the... Uh, the when, when, the yeah, when the movie vastly drifts away from its fight club you know story and becomes t- just t- terrorist the movie i would have to disagree with that i actually think that the entire point of the film <clears throat> is it's very anti consumerism yeah you know we see i mean for example we see edward norton's uh, yin yang table on fire after Oh, the, the, the apartment, apartment blowing up. Oh, that's something as well. The, the apartment blowing up, but we see, we see that absolutely everything that he described earlier to us just yes. on fire. Yeah, symbolizing the end of his material life. Ah, oh, his beginning as smart. Basically, as Brad Pitt. I don't know what to call him because you see, the biggest issue to me with this film is that 
both of the main characters are Tyler Durden. <laughs> well, I don't, is that so, yeah, true? So it's so hard to just explain. To, it's like, ah, oh, Tyler Durden. Like, which fucking one? <laughs> which one? You have to use actor names. So Brad Pitt blows up his apartment, blows up Edward Norton's apartment. Fuck. <laughs> and, you know, that's when his life as Brad Pitt, as this alter ego, begins, and it begins to spiral out of control. And mm. this all leads to sort of him reconciling with other men who also feel this same sort of anger at consumerism and this consumerist culture that they're in. Mm. Which is what this movie sort of... It, well, it's not sort of. It's what the movie's really about. It's about this... this genera- it's actually a generational piece about Gen X who have grown up in this America who have been, you know, sort of sold on the lie of the white picket fence life you know you can have it all if you work hard enough yeah it's a good shot though at the end at the end of the film when the builders do explode <laughs> it, it, it looks very cool when they just stood there you see i think by net modern standards it definitely looks fake you can absolutely <laughs> tell that these are <laughs> crop buildings being knocked down but it is quite it's still quite a good scene you know you still get that full impact of what they're what they're doing, and almost you know both Helen Bonham Carter and Edward Norton, their characters accept that it's going to happen no matter what. Yeah. So they just sit back and relax, even though you know Edward Norton's defeated Brad Pitt at this point. He just sits back, he accepts. He can't stop this. He can't stop these towers from falling down, and whatever happens, happens. Yeah, that's a good way to sum it up. And what I think would be quite an intro. I mean, we, this hasn't actually happened, but there's never been a sequel to this film. You know, we're sort of left as an yeah. open-ended question. Wonder, what actually I, happens after yeah. this film? I was going to ask. That was my next question. Was uh, what? What do you think? Like, where do you think he goes after this? Because he has just well, he has committed a uh, a huge. It's not even that he's committed a crime. <clears throat> I think. Because this um, wipes out, like, this is all the banks go, like, all the, basically the symbolism here is that every single bank in the world is gone. Everyone's savings, everyone's debt, it's all gone, everyone starts at zero. And I guess whatever money they've got hidden. Yeah, them, but I don't think you'd get away with that. Oh, I think he'd probably... No, because this is, you see, we're looking at this from, you know, 2023 <laughs> society. 1999 was very different. If those True. computers went, they went. <laughs> there wasn't backups. People didn't fucking think of these things. So, I think it all just sets back to zero, and there's almost like... Do you know an episode it... of Rick and Morty where it's like... I haven't Rick watched Rick and Morty. The, uh, Rick sets... You haven't watched it? No. <laughs> okay, it's by a guy who beats his wife. <coughs> but, you know, there's an episode where uh, Rick sets like... Oh, you have a galactic currency to zero? And just all chaos breaks loose. Because it's like, I'm going to, you know, what's your armed guard going to do when he's not getting paid to guard you? He's going to rob you. He's going to kill you for your money. So, I don't know. I think, I feel like there'd be like a week or so of just absolute chaos where nothing can really happen because no one can buy anything and people are pissed that they've lost their savings and just world governments collapse I think that might be like the follow on from this film just (laughs) the collapse of governments and absolute anarchy for at least a week probably years not everything becomes fight club fight for survival holy I, actually, yes. Yeah. I think you've cracked. Yeah. I think you might have cracked it. Uh, Everything becomes Fight Club, <coughs> and so those who engage circle. with Fight Club rise to the top of the social ladder immediately because they know how to fight and take a beating as well. I think that might be it. We've cracked Fight Club. We have figured it out. Fight, <coughs> fight Club solved. Title. <laughs> yeah. There we go. That's the title right there. We've right. got the title. Well, I think on that note, I think that is the film pr- pretty well rounded up. I think. Okay, so let's go into the uh, the tier list. So at the moment, this is how it's looking. We're only a couple films in. 
You say the tier list, Joe. You mean the only bit of the podcast that matters? Yes. This is this is the the vi- This is the vital part. The, the only important part. I mean, at the moment, this is the caloric intake that there the we podcast go. provides. The rest of it is nothing but sugar and fat. But this, or this is twenty grams of straight protein injected <laughs> into your veins. This is this is what really matters. All right. I mean, as you, as you can see, currently we've got. We do have we have a film in the S tier. I don't well, think as it's... as the year goes on, more and more films will get onto this. Yes. So now we get to the important question: Where does Fight Club sit amongst this god tier tier list? I would uh, like to hear your opinion first, Joe, because I think it might differ. I think I already know where you're going to put this. Okay. And I know where I want to put this. All right. Well. It is. It's definitely better than Crank. I'm going to say that off the bat. Now, oh yeah. Now I will agree. Now looking at it, I have a feeling that maybe we might have been too nice on Crank. I don't think no, because I think even if Crank, like we drop it down, it would. We're definitely. It's definitely going to be above Crank. Um, yeah. Now. My first, my first thought is to put it in A. I don't think it's an S tier film. Mm, I absolutely, I absolutely agree with that. I yeah. just think, I think some of it is like, I guess the social impact of it somewhat has aged, and so it kind of loses mm. that that sort of feel of it could be someone's favorite film. I know, yeah. I'd like, I've looked at <clears throat> reviews of this online. It's been, you know. Oh, this is my favourite film, whatever. But I just don't think it could be there. I don't think it could match what everything, everywhere, all at once yeah. did. Yeah, and, and that's not to say that it's a bad... Like, a, a is still a very, very high tier. You know, we haven't even delved into some of the lower ones yet. I mean, we haven't really ha- had a film. And not until next week, God. Next my week. God, next week I'll be fighting no, for a ne- low tier. Next week... I think the void, maybe the void. Might uh, get well, new. we'll get to we'll get to it. But so, so, so <laughs> it is still very high. But I agree that you know it's a very famous film. <clears throat> but I think overall, I think every everything everywhere all at once. You know that that's got its S tier status. So that, that that film has like made changes, especially like for actors. For you know, it's overall it had more it just impact. Did some, it, it's very. I think. In the year 2022, it's very hard to do something original with films. Yeah. When from about 1928, you know, talkies almost have been a staple of modern society. Mm -hmm. You know, we see films absolutely everywhere. I mean, you even go, you would go back and watch some of those original films and they still hold up. These ideas couldn't be replicated nowadays because they already exist and they exist in this perfect form. Yeah. Everything everywhere all at once did something truly unique. Yeah, that different. hadn't been tried before, made it work with actors that are amazing telling an actual impactful story. And Fight Club unfortunately just does not do this. No, it's it a very tells good a film. Story, but, but yeah. It isn't a masterpiece. Almost. No. I I would agree. I think that's going to be quite a controversial point. I think a lot of people would consider it as I mean it's a very famous film you know you go up to most people like most people who enjoy watching movies and you ask them like if they know about Fight Club a majority of people will say that they I have watched any, it any or know about it seen this film yeah absolutely so I I, th- I think for that reason alone it it, it has to sit above crank I, I feel like we're going to look back and th- especially maybe like when this tier list is a bit more filled out, we're going to look back and consider whether or not we were too good on Crank. But I, no, I, I, I think, think for no, now... I, I, I personally love Crank. It was done. Yeah, it, it, was it, it is a good film, I guess. B-tier. Yeah. Not high B-tier, but, you know, B-tier. Yeah. So I, I, I think we're going to have to... I'm going to say A. High, obviously, I, only g- spite an A. I'm going to differ. I'm okay. gonna say high B. I'm gonna say where really? we put Crank Murphy, just because I think that the mind fuck has been done better than this film since it came out. I think more, especially Mulholland Drive, 
this is that is the one film that sort of sticks in my mind as the mind mm. fuck perfected and fight club is a long way away from that if that makes mm. sense it's not a bad movie and it should definitely be a higher tier you know higher b tier film than crank but at the same time it's still eh, it's it, it's good I wouldn't. I mean, I wouldn't mind it being low A tier, but I wouldn't want to see it ahead of actually. Okay, you know what? I will. Ag- I'll agree with you then. I'll agree with you as long as it sits above Crank. Um, <laughs> I, I, I think I, I'm happy with that. And I mean, it doesn't matter what Karen Deacus thinks; they're not here, and so I they, think they have not seen this film. I, no, actually, Cam- maybe Cameron's watched it, but I don't think Deacus has. Deacus mm. does not watch a lot of films. So, uh, are we settling on? High B above crank, yeah, yeah. Are we happy with that? Uh, high, B- I thought we were going low A. <laughs> we go low. Oh, we go low A. I'll, I'll go. You know what? I'll go low A. I was being a bit, uh, you know, controversial. I for did the say, I, I did say A. So I th- maybe low A is a bit more reasonable because it is. A, I think it's a it's, as a film, it's a lot better than Crank. So I think it, ha- it can be has to be out of the beta. Yeah. But maybe not one of the best movies I ever. Don't, I don't think I don't think Crank should be our anchor like base films off. True. <laughs> Low A then, yeah? Are we happy with that? Low A. Alright, okay. And as Cameron said last week, with the power of movie magic. <laughs> there it is. There we go. Fight Club in oh, the A tier. A tier. The only film that sits there for now, but it probably will be a bit further back <laughs> in the future. I think I, I, I think in coming weeks, I think uh, people can expect we're going to have some films. We, we seem to have picked all pretty good films so far. We you know, we wanted to start out strong, but um, I know starting next week, we're going to really get into like the the depths of this tier list and start. Do really not wo- <laughs> do not worry, ladies, gentlemen, and in betweens. I know some truly trash films. Yeah, there's we some, will be there's doing. some that belong in the void, and we will watch them. And they may or may not be called Puss in Boots. Oh, <laughs> early call outs right there. Early Cameron call is not going to be happy about if that. If Cameron's watching, we're coming for you, Cameron. You Puss <laughs> in Boots, motherfucker. <laughs> right, well, um, I think that wraps everything up. See, this is yeah. starting to build. I like it. Yeah, you know, each week, I think it's going to be quite a satisfying thing. Each, this tier list is getting bigger and bigger, and we're going to see more and more films. We're going to see contests between the actual tiers, more and more conflict within these debates, and it's going to be an interesting thing. So make sure to stick around, subscribe, yeah. you know, to find out what happens with this tier list by the end of the year, because it's going to get interesting. And our final note, like I did last week, I'm going to ask one final question before we finish. Oh, All right. I would not fuck my cat. I, could, uh, I it's just Ryan's, it's just Ryan, the only person here. It's only going to revolve around you. So my question this week to end this off is, Ryan, what is the first rule of Fight Club? I'm um, sorry, I can't tell you the first rule of Fight. Perfect. Well, that has been uh, the Fight Club episode of the Worst Movie Podcast in the World. Thank you very much for watching. Uh, Make sure to like, subscribe, and drop a comment as well. It's very much appreciated. It is. Please please subscribe. Please. (laughs)